David. Well, hello there, Darren. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Thanks for having me here in Watsonville. One, Watsonville, one of your greenhouses. Um, every time I come here, I'm always blown away at how you go about growing food, how you use energy systems, what you're growing, the purpose of growing those things. Um, it's always brings home the idea that there's no waste. There's always potential. And you are the epitome of demonstrating in the ground, on the ground, and in a farm how to actually do that. So, so thanks for having me here again. It's always so invigorating to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you around, Darren. Yeah. So, dude, you've been doing this for... Decades. Decades. <coughs> Quite a while. Right. You betcha. So, let's go all the way back. All right. I want to go... I want to hear, because I don't know if I've heard the origin story, like how you got into being one of the greatest permaculturists, uh biologist ecologist in the world where did that start how did it come to be oh gosh darren i mean it goes back to necessity i grew up being uh, a subsistence farmer in san francisco mm. my family didn't have any money you know and uh to have good food we had to grow it in our city backyard so what was my first permaculture act other than the the natural stuff because my father was uh, knew a lot about ecology and I did nothing but devour ecology books when I was a kid but mm -hmm. I think the most clear thing I did is to show that that economy and ecology are the same thing mm -hmm. and I think the way I first did that was I went to my neighbor who was an elderly German uh, fella great carpenter and I said to him Mr. Shaney can I I use your background to grow food too, and you can eat all you want, and we'll eat the rest. So you used his backyard to grow and experiment and take all this ecological knowledge from your dad and the books you've read and experiment on the neighbor's yard. Well, and our own yard, because mm -hmm. we had three kids, and it wasn't quite big enough to feed us all. So I combined economy and ecology by making economic activity with my neighbor mm. for an ecological reason mm. so we uh so we had a wonderful time growing lots and lots of food and then the neighbor on the other side said you guys are having too much fun and i want in on the action you can use my yard mm. and all of a sudden now we had not only enough food for all of us and of course the two neighbors to eat all they wanted but now we had extra food mm. so we made things like pickles you know we had the best kosher pickles we grew all the only herbs and stuff and, and you know we were kids we sold them in the neighborhood door to door you know and so um i think necessity is the mother of invention we've often heard that but uh it's also inspirational in other words when you're a kid not having a lot of money isn't accompanied by the terror of running out of money right. it's just like oh i have to make do with what i've got and still be happy, which is a natural thing for kids. And so I was very happy being an economic unit that was growing in my backyard. And that was the start of my feelings of abundance. And there was so much potential everywhere you were, including my neighbor's backyard. Wow. Yeah, it's like uh, you didn't have much, but you saw the power in nature to right in front of you show abundance put one seed in the ground and pl proliferate fruit and edible food. plants and food and everything else and you could produce that well you know what i what i think is i started thinking in terms of uh, even before i you know got involved uh, in the 60s and the stuff we all got involved in i didn't have my perspective completely opened up till then but I understood the difference between shortages and surpluses. Right. So we had a shortage of food, and my neighbor had a surplus of land he wasn't using. Well, it seemed just logical that you right. make those shortages and, and uh, surpluses go together. So you'll never, ever really hear me say something's bad or good. It's like, 
yeah, there's a little bit of a shortage there, and over here's a little bit of a surplus that balances that out. You know, now there's some things that are really bad, like nuclear waste. Okay, there's no, there's no, uh, no real good use for nuclear waste, right. and you need to put it far away where no one will touch it. You know, so there's a few things that don't fit that rule, but almost everything else, you can look at it as it's a surplus, it's a shortage. What is the ecology or economy? or the world need to bring that into balance. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's there's a person on my corner who's talking to herself and is homeless, you know, and I have a surplus of tomatoes, you know, and she's got kind of a shortage of joy at the very moment, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it just makes sense to me to take that bag of tomatoes to her and change her day because right. I'm bringing surplus to shortage, you know, a right. shortage of joy. I have globes of joy that I could share with somebody. It's the simplest thing, yeah. you know? And so once you start looking at the world that way, you're always looking to balance the world right. with yourself. Right. Yeah. And you're such a powerhouse that way. It's like, even today when we were talking with some companies and people learning about what you did and the tour, I literally learn every time I hear you talk and even abridged versions from your perspective. But, yes. but like a, a perfect example of that is, you know, you have this duckweed, you have the cattails, but the bugs, right? And you have this open, uh, you know, greenhouse. Right. And so and the, one of the first things you did is like, do you, do you see any bugs eating these leaves? Oh, you don't. Right. So right. talk to us about how you set up, because this is a perfect example of how you look at systems and their law and their breakdown. Right. Or what you can do to circulate the the efficiencies of them all and have them all win. So talk to us about the bug thing. A lot of people laugh at me because whenever they bring me a problem, I say, you're so lucky. OK, <laughs> so. So what we were talking about today is when I moved in here, this place was an ecological disaster. It had been chemically farmed for ages and ages. And, you know, the anything you'd grow here was, you know, going to have a tough time to start with until the soil got improved. So anyway, I grow my first crop, and there's just, just gobs of bugs everywhere. So I had a surplus of bugs, okay? And so I thought about it for a little bit, and I said, well, I do know because I'm an ecologist, that 20 tons of bug meat moves through my greenhouse every year. Because at in temperate climates, that's how many bugs there are, 20 tons per acre, and they're moving, move mm -hmm. through your property, and usually eating along the way. So I said, I have a surplus of bugs. What can I do with a surplus of bugs? And by the way, I have a surplus of work, too. I have way too much work. So how am I going to deal with the bugs and not increase the amount of work I have to do? So I thought about it and said, well, I need someone else to do the work of dealing with the bugs. So how do I get those, those um, helpers in here? Well, it was really simple. I had a light bulb go off in my head, so I hung up a lantern, a real light bulb, and I opened the doors to my greenhouse, wide open to the bugs and everything, and at night, that light was shining. And that line, light shined out the door. And who knows how far away insects saw it. And anybody who's ever been in the tropics knows that the bugs come to lights and they whirl around in a big vortex. But other things know that too, not just me. Frogs know that. So the frogs came hopping over here too. And where I had put this light up in the air, I had already built a little one and a half foot wide by 10 foot long pond in the ground and a pile of rocks next to it. You made some good homes for That's the uh, right. eventual uh, so, frogs. So the frogs got there and wow, there's all these bugs to eat. And wow, there's a jacuzzi. And, you know, there's a condominium and I can move in. And so the, the frogs did. And so tens of thousands over and over again of frogs um, had little babies and eggs and tadpoles and hatched and went off into the greenhouse till at night you come in here in the spring mm -hmm. and you had to put in earplugs Symphony. because the frog singing was so loud it would deafen you. Wow. And so, you know, what happened? The 20 tons of bugs? Well, 
they were frog food. And the frogs pooped them out all over the greenhouse. Right. Wow, I didn't have to bring 20 tons of compost into the greenhouse with a wheelbarrow. The frogs did it for me. You see, so yeah. I have a surplus of frogs. I have a reduction in work. Yeah. So it's, it's going to war with the bugs. That's more work. And it never goes well. And that's where, you know, we could talk a lot about going to war against the bugs. And we create chemicals and pesticides and herbicides and all of that stuff and you've spent so a couple things you spent your life looking at this through systems approach That's permaculture right. and you're kind of one of the grandfathers of permaculture and learning well i i i would say that i i built on the shoulders of giants i mean i yeah. taught with bill mollison you know and uh I'd like to say that the other uh, four bears of mine, you know, were really very influential in my way of looking at things in a permaculture lens, uh, which is a, its own peculiar way of looking at the world. And it has great techniques for helping to figure out, observing and figuring out what to do with your land. But combined with ecology and biosystematics, well, now it's a, a monstrously uh, fruitful way to look at things. Yeah, so describe for everyone listening here, from your perspective, what does perma permanent culture mean? What does permaculture mean to you? Well, I hes hesitate to try to come up with a, a brief way of saying it, but it's understanding that you are standing in the middle of multiple intersecting systems with every step you take. Hmm. And so what you need to ask yourself is, where am I? Well, that's kind of simple. I'm standing here in this greenhouse. When am I? Like, what time of day is it? Or it was? Is it a hundred years ago now, or is it now? Like, what what was it like a hundred years ago at this place? And and you you start looking at it many different axes, not just the flat ground as a map. You have time. Mm -hmm. You have seasons, like mm -hmm. how you know the bugs moving through the land, and you know when when are the frogs reproducing and there's all these disparate events happening around, and you have to sit there and say, how does it all relate to each other? You can never actually get it because there are too many variables, but big pieces inform whatever activity you're going to do and help guide you mm -hmm. with information that isn't in any book, but is picked up by your senses, your observations, listening, smelling, seeing, and integrating all that stuff in your brain to say, what should I do today? And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful way to live, to be looking at all these patterns and find yourself at the nexus point of all these intersected patterns and ask yourself, what do I do today? What do I do now? What do I do at the end of the week to yeah. make this stuff all work? Yeah, it's such a, I mean, that's, it's, it's almost a, a map of living right and it's almost spiritual in its nature and it's almost when i hear you talk about it it is it is the 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 precipice or the best example of that we are not separate from we are a part of nature we are nature and you're fully saying hey man i'm going to observe it i'm going to follow the inputs and the outputs, because it's like, right, you're here and you've experimented on a thousand million things throughout your here. And, and through that refining, you figure out what works, right? You've got methane digesters here and figuring out how you have cattails. I learned so much about cattails that blew me away today <laughs> by, by all of the work that you've done. I just love that. And it's, and, and I mean, everyone listening here, there is a distinct difference between what you're describing because that really goes back to you know the, the aboriginals we were in australia they're talking right. about sixty thousand years they said like we've been we've been you know we've been operating that system yeah exactly and and so but we also now see us in a place where we divorce that a long time we do from a from an agricultural mass perspective the differences of what you're saying and doing as opposed to now you know 90 percent of the people in the early 1900s were farmers right pretty close yes yeah. and then 60 70 80 percent for sure right two percent today two percent today yeah 
which is just, and so it's bigger and less people having it and chemically created. And so, I mean, what, where, where do we even start and, and, and what do you think about well, what the hell we're doing and why we did it? Okay, so don't sell yourself short, Darren. And no, anyone listening should not feel like, oh my God, we're lost. I'm not a farmer. It's like you wouldn't be here today if your great grandparents didn't grow food yeah. and were successful at it because you, they had it, your grandparents had enough to eat, your parents had enough to eat, and you have enough to eat. And you're not that far divorced from farming. And you'll find deep in your DNA are things that you were good at five, six generations ago before you were born that made you an adaptive farmer. Almost none of us are hunter-gatherers like we were millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the last 10,000 years, only good farmers survived and the fact that you're sitting here today means everybody who came before you was a good farmer. So I teach kids a bit about farming and permaculture, and it's amazing to watch that ancient knowledge come right through a kid's perspective into their fingers and their hands, knowing somehow what to do with planting seeds like we did the other day at our local elementary school with some kids. It's like you look at that going, how did they know to do that? And the answer is, it's laid down in the genes and in codes we don't even understand that make us who we are today. And we are very, very briefly divorced from being farmers. Right. And it takes almost no effort to regain that skill again. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think the stat is like we now have very rapidly from your from our perspective in this conversation, very rapidly we went from mostly living outside. Uh, being very connected to mostly inside. I think it's about 93% of our lives are inside now. But what you're saying is, hey, man, that's okay. Because in the grand scheme of humanism, <laughs> we, we just did this little blip that we can easily go back to, and it's really accessible. And so we have to actually start doing it, right? Well, more and more people are doing it. During the pandemic, it's amazing how many people found themselves just like I did in my family when I was a kid, not quite having enough food. Yeah. You know, nobody was working during the pandemic. Unemployment was through the roof. Try to buy seeds during the pandemic. It was nearly impossible right. because everybody's inner farmer said, grow food. <laughs> right. And they all started doing it. Right. And I was so pleased. Now, I wasn't too affected because I save my seeds from year to year and select the very best plants on my farming, save those seeds, hoping that next year I'll have even better plants. But watching the, all the seed companies just racing to keep up with this immense desire to grow a little food for themselves, Americans just surprised me once again. Yeah with uh, as much as they may not want to think of themselves as influenced by the environment and the world and animals and the sky and weather, all of a sudden they're out in their yards planting vegetables because it was time. Yeah. Well, you get squeezed a little bit from the, the uh, I use this term, fatal convenience, right? We've got so convenient we can order something and the, even your food's going to show up at your door and all of that stuff. And then the world goes through a wobble. And all of a sudden, what you thought was secure isn't so secure. So then that goes to your point, which makes total sense. Go, whoa, things aren't as secure as we think. And then you go all the way back to the essentials. You go like, uh, makes sense to grow some food right now. Yeah, what makes a person who's never started a garden before go online and buy seeds? I mean, it's got to be somewhere deep inside. Yeah. You know, when the... Uh, most of us who are your, your age and my age, we remember the fall of the Soviet Union, mm. which was a big deal. And everyone thought that in Moscow, the, the biggest city in Russia, there was going to be mass starvation. Mm. And it didn't happen. It's like people in Russia never trusted there'd be really enough food all the time. So they had these long, deep uh, lots behind their house. And they often had a place in the country, a little place, 
and they gardened. They had farm animals for food. And when everything went to heck, the, the big city of Moscow, it did fine. People were already growing about enough food to eat. Yeah, they didn't have as much bread as they had before. And, you know, you couldn't buy vodka as easily. But that got remedied pretty quick. We remember how to moonshine, too, when we're put to it. So the point was Moscow, a giant city in the world, did not go into a massive starvation spiral because everybody there still in their genes were Mm -hmm. farmers. We all are farmers. Yeah, it's amazing. I I love that perspective because it's true. It's really true. Like demonstrated over and over again with every burp and wrinkle and hazard and and disaster. It's like we I'll give you a story about farmers, about their bravery. So in the Philippines, uh, there used to be some dictators, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Marcos and Imelda and three seed companies came to uh, Marcos and said, Well, these three varieties of rice are the very best varieties for making the most money. But, you know, your your farmers use all kinds of old seeds. You're going to have to really, you know, make them decide to use these seeds. And we'd like to pay you just one big suitcase of money to make these three types of rice, the official rice of the Philippines. And so we did because, hey, it's just business. And so the decree went out that these are the only three types of rice you can grow or there was a penalty. We'd shoot you in your field if we find other kinds of rice. So so it was definitely a monopoly enforced by the government. So everybody grew those three varieties of rice. And what year was this? Oh, this had to be in the, oh, don't quote me because you'll know how old I am. But in my lifetime, this happened. And... uh, and so what happened was, uh, after three years, Imelda and, uh, and, and Marcos had to leave the Philippines. You know, basically things were too hot and the government fell. And, you know, the following year, 89,000 varieties of rice were grown in the Philippines. Because under the threat of death, every farmer buried and saved their seeds, knowing governments come and go but seeds are forever. Wow. That is a further point of what you're saying. It went back to our almost that deep reptilian brain, this is how we survive aspect, save this so that we can survive and, and grow maybe food. it's Maybe it's that our heart and the, the rice patty, in this case, were all one not the reptilian brain. This right. was the love, the love of the beauty of nature and knowing the power of seeds. Right. And it's like, ah, governments, they come right. and go, all right, we'll grow their we'll rice for three years, but they'll leave and we need to have our seeds. And yeah. they did, and they did it. Yeah, that's amazing. And so, you know, there's so many things here because I want to talk about the... The carbohydrate economy. Sure. Definitely. And then I want to talk about, well, it's going to dovetail into the, into the alcohol, into the ethanol and all of that stuff. But, but as you see, maybe set it up, setting it up in this way, like as you see the world right now and as you see the dependence on fossil fuels and some of the insanity and frankly, some of the, 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 green clean climate change initiatives also don't make sense right sometimes sometimes yes. so so and 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 the work that you've been doing around you know what when how where what kind of crops all of that stuff so let's break this down in terms of the carbohydrate economy and how we can create independence not only in food but also power and utilization of land well, people act as if the carbohydrate economy is like a new idea. But it's only about 10,000 years old, and we had a brief excursion from it with the petrochemical economy. Yeah. Uh, but now it's really clear that the carbohydrate economy never went away. So carbohydrates are really simple, Darren. You know, carbo is carbon dioxide. Hydrate is water, right? You hydrate with water. And what glues water 
and uh, and carbon dioxide together is sunlight, but only in a plant. So so-called photosynthesis uses sunlight as the power to stick together, yeah. you know, carbon dioxide and water, and now you've got sugar. It's the best solar power ever. Absolutely, and it's and it's done universally by right. plants everywhere. And so then plants can get fancy. They can link a bunch of sugars together and call it starch. Or they can link a bunch of sugars together and call it uh, inulin, another right. carbohydrate, right. which you'll find in cactuses, et cetera. But all these things are more easily preserved forms of sugar. Everything likes to eat sugar. Not too much likes to eat starch. Right. So plants store their energy as starch until they need them again, need that energy later, like in the heart of a seed. And then when it's time to grow, well, tiny, tiny little enzymes are released when the seed gets wet and the starch is turned back into sugar. Just like any brewer will take grain and dissolve the grain to make beer. So instead of feeding yeast to make beer, that sugar in this case powers the plant to send up a stalk, open its solar collectors, and now it can make its own sugar from sunlight and water and carbon dioxide. So we have stored energy in the seed in the form of starch, a carbohydrate, which then sends up the parasol to then be you know self-sufficient so seeds store their energy so do cattails in the the bottom of a cattail plant in a marsh there is a very waterproof uh fibrous layer and in the middle of it is this juicy like syrupy um liquid starch in the middle where all the energy is stored and when it gets to be winter and the tops of the cattails you know die off and ice goes over the marsh those rhizomes just sit down there with all that food energy. And then the spring comes, it starts to melt, and the starch turns back to sugar, and up comes the cattails out of the marsh. So plants store energy in the form of carbohydrates. In fact, once a plant is three or four inches above the ground, it's making more carbohydrate than it's using to grow and wow. starting to store it right away. Yeah, so those next, I mean, I want to break apart a couple things here because, you know, we're 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 so it, we're cruising down toward trying to electrify the world, uh, solar panels, silica, solar panels built in China with coal factories and like everything else, and and yet we're staring at perfectly created nature created solar panels. And, yes. And right. So you've already just described the perfect nature of that conversion. But then you take it to another place in terms of distillation for us to actually use some of those resources for fuel. Sure. For, so isn't that the genesis of real solar power? Well, real solar power is the sun. You know, and as long as we have sun, we have we'll have um, chlorophyll. We'll have car. You know, we'll have the ability to metabolize everything into carbohydrates. So then, some of the carbohydrates become fibrous and they become stiff, and they can become trees with uh, some resins they get from the soil, etc. So, so but the key thing it always goes back to the sun because that's our free input of energy. Our planet. It's not a closed system of energy where if you use something, well, then that's the end of it and there's no more. Right. We have this enormous income of sun every day, which is we only touch a little bit of it. And instead, we use these buried old plants like oil or coal right. when it's just silly with the hundreds of millions of times energy we need every day coming to us from the sun. Now, at some point, the sun will burn out, and then we have real problems. Luckily, that's not for four and a half billion years. So until then, we have an open system, not a closed system. We have more energy coming in each day, and it's not like you use the energy, it degrades and goes away into nothingness, mm -hmm. which is the way physicists describe energy. But in our case, it's just constantly renewed every day. Every time we wake up, there's a new brilliant day of energy input so uh we shouldn't be so worried about will we run out of energy the only thing we need to worry about is will our environment be destroyed and pursuing forms of energy which do run out mm -hmm. like coal 
like natural gas, like oil, which, you know, were a one-time event in history produced in the ground. <clears throat> and once those are all burned up, well, they're gone. Mm -hmm. Well, why are we using them anyway when we have wonderful plants uh, and, and climate-based energies that can run everything? Now, solar panels, ah, eh, you know, they're a neat trick. But, um, but we have many other ways you know, many other things in the world that we can use to make all the power we need. And, you know, people think power is electricity, but power is anything that moves something. Like, now think about this, Darren. Back, way back, when we didn't have tractors, people go, oh, tractors, that's new technology. You don't want to use that. You want to go back to the land with your shovel and your fork. And, well, I got to tell you, I, you know, when I was younger, I loved to sweat. It was great. But I got to tell you something, one gallon of alcohol is fuel, or it could be diesel or it could be gasoline. And you put it in a machine, one gallon of fuel, concentrated solar energy, that alcohol is, is equal to 180 person hours of work. That one gallon of fuel would mean a month of digging trenches with the fork and shovel. So, you know, I'm going to use the gift solar gives me. In other words, the solar energy trapped as sugar, fermented, distilled, and now I've got fuel to run my lawnmower, my chainsaw, my you know tractor, etc. And I'm not going to eschew modern intelligent devices that reduce the amount of uh, time it takes me to get something done because it allows me to get more done because I want I want surplus. Right. So if I have some alcohol and use tools like my tractor i can make a surplus and i can feed a lot of other people my farm could easily feed four or five hundred people and i'm only 15 acres right so the idea is not to get caught up in dogma to understand systems to understand that fuel isn't bad but some fuels are negative in the environment and some like alcohol are neutral or better and we can still have our machines we can still be efficient we can still produce wonderful surpluses for our neighbors and friends and even the market if we need to sell stuff right and so we don't need to destroy the planet just to make the surplus we can work with the planet grow our fuel and do the same thing right yeah that's the and and you know we're people aren't seeing that part of this is uh you have an amazing distillation and fermentation and alcohol process right you have molasses you have waste streams you have candy that you've converted into alcohol so describe the difference between and i want to let's get into the numbers of how powerful this is to grow food as alcohol but before that talk about the difference between because people are like well it's alcohol and it's still dirty but like we just saw today, when you burn gasoline and you burn alcohol, is a major difference because oh, there's yeah. a lot of other stuff. So what's the differences? Well, uh, alcohol is made from, as I said earlier, it's made from carbon dioxide, yeah. water, and sunlight. It's a carbohydrate that's been fermented by yeast and made into alcohol. Yeah. So it's a fermented carbohydrate. So when you burn that, what goes out the sales tailpipe? Well, what was it made of? Carbon dioxide and water it goes out the tailpipe, and some solar heat goes out the tailpipe, which is waste. You know, mm -hmm. your engine didn't use all of the solar energy that was trapped in the alcohol, but all that goes back into the atmosphere. And well, that carbon dioxide and water goes to be absorbed by the next crop making alcohol. It is sugars, then starches, and then alcohol, and goes out the tailpipe again. So it's a circle. Mm -hmm. So as a circle, exhaust is not bad. It's just, oh, surplus water and carbon dioxide for next year's crop. Yeah. But when you put old, old oil into your car and you burn it, it puts new carbon dioxide and water. And now we get a surplus of carbon dioxide and water in the atmosphere, and that causes problems with our climate. Right. So recycling the carbon dioxide water via solar energy, which powers our vehicles or our tractors or our chainsaws, is a harmless activity. Right. And plus, you said you can see it when the flame, too. All of the other chemicals and processes that are there to make what was once 
heavy petroleum into gasoline. Talk to us a little bit about that because it's also, yeah, you're putting in the atmosphere is trapped by the by the earth, but it's also full of other crap that we don't want in our atmosphere. Well, in kind of a way, Rockefeller had a little permaculture thinking. He said, well, when I make kerosene or I make heating oil, I have all this surplus liquid left over. It's really volatile. You know, if you if you try to put it in an old fashioned oil lamp, you know, the glass lamp with the wick in it. If you put that waste stuff in there and lit the wick. Well, another way of calling that what it is, it's a Molotov cocktail because it's not kerosene. It's not fuel oil. It's all the volatile stuff. So nobody wanted that. They had no use for it. They couldn't put it in their oil lamps in the 1800s. So he flushed it into rivers were caught on fire because it floats on top of water. Four or five hundred different chemicals were in that stew that he threw away. But nowadays, that's what we call gasoline. And on, on when you make nylons and plastic and, and this and that out of oil, whatever's left over is thrown together as waste products, right, surpluses. And then Rockefeller was smart enough to figure out how to, to take alcohol-powered engines and cars from the early 1900s and get them to run on this toxic stew of a mess called gasoline. And it didn't run so well, and it was low octane compared to alcohol's 106 octane, and gasoline was like 50 octane. So it ran like terribly, but you know, it was cheaper. Mm. And there's the, there's the, you know, the consciousness of, well, if it's cheaper, that's what I have to buy. And it's like, you know, you better figure out the total impact of your costs. Right. And so do I really want to give my money to Rockefeller? Or would I rather give it to Bob down the road who's got surplus potatoes this year and made alcohol to run tractors and give him the money? Right. So, you know, that's, that's a matter of is it cheaper to give it to someone other than Bob? Because Bob's going to spend it in the store in town. And the guy in the store who takes his 10 cents for the, you know, from from Bob is not going to use it to, uh, you know, hire your kid to sweep the floor in the, you know, in the store. And so all of a sudden you start to realize that the exchange of energy, which is what money is, you want to make sure you give it to a place that it will be respent, redeployed multiple times as close to home as possible. Right. So you convinced all of most of certainly in the United States and many other places to use this waste stream that he had that he had no reason for is full of crap to then take what we are already using as clean energy sources to to reconfigure the engines to burn something uh, cheaper but worse for the environment uh, and and the 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 obviously there's obvious problems to all of that stuff and and there's a we become a victim to it too at this point because we we don't we don't have another choice but but we actually do yes you know i'll be darren you and you've seen this darren you and i'll be in a room and i'll ask people name the country that is already largely off of gasoline and no longer needs it and tell me what fuel they're running on First of all, people don't even know what I'm talking about. You see 99 people out there doing things. One guy puts his hand up. Oh, that country is Brazil. Right. And I go, correct. Where are you from? Oh, Brazil. Right. Because here we are in America, the most well-informed population anywhere in the world. And how is it that we don't know a country almost as large as ours no longer uses straight gasoline? Right. They use 95% alcohol for all new vehicles. And ones that don't even have fuel injection, well, that's 25% alcohol. The Brazilians get rid of all their waste on the market. They don't burn it in their cars. So here's one of the biggest countries in the world running on alcohol right now. And there are 50 other countries currently converting away from oil. Uh, India was the latest to announce it. And they expect within about five to six years to be on 40% alcohol uh, and heading for 100% as fast as they can get there and get off of oil altogether. Why don't we hear about that in America? Right. We should and be celebrating that. And that's the question. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. we should be celebrating that. Yep. And so some of, the, some of the math around this, right? Like on a napkin, of course. Like what do we, what could, so to become independent, like Brazil, 
growing carbohydrate, uh, ethanol, distillation for ethanol. What could we do? Give me some examples of how that could work for us to be energy independent, at least from the fuel source. Well, rather than say what could be here, I'll use an actual example. Uh, Pre-World War II Germany, right? Before World War II, when Germany got into a war with the rest of the world. So Germany didn't have any oil. Had coal, but heck, can't run a car on coal, right? So they made alcohol, mostly from potatoes and then from beets. And alcohol is what ran the few engines that needed to be run before, uh, before the World War II. And uh, basically, farmers brought their load of potatoes or beets into a local distillery. It, they, you know, they got back the alcohol, one third of it. The distillery sold the other two thirds to city people for fuel. And the farmer got back all the pulp left over, everything that wasn't sugar, mm -hmm. right? That was made into alcohol. So the farmer took that back and fed it to the pigs or put it right on the land and used it for fertilizer because it had everything that was in the plant just not the sugar right. so so how effective was that system i mean what did it give germany uh it gave germany that a way that it almost beat the united states in world war ii it needed to import no fuel whatsoever those seventy-seven thousand local cooperative distilleries powered germany for through four years of world war ii and instead of just bombing two or three distilleries from the air, which the United States could have done quickly and, you know, set up, this war is over. It took them four years to bomb all those farm-based distilleries. Wow. And that's why Germany was able to withstand. So that at the end of the war, in the Nuremberg Accords, Germany had to agree to not restart its alcohol economy as part of the Nuremberg Accords because they were so terrifying when they were supplied with their own fuel and could not be cut off of it. So if you want to know what's powerful in a country controlling its own fuel, think of a peaceful version, not of World War II, but of running your entire country on your own fuel and not caring if another country invades someone else because you're dependent on their oil, like Europe has been with the Soviet Union or Russia. Um, you know, when the war in Ukraine started. And it's like, you're going to, because you need fuels from someone else, you're willing to disregard your long, proud history of democracy? That's, that's just so wrong. So if there's, you know, and Germany knew better. They were energy independent before World War II. So what I'm saying is every country, so that it cannot be moved off its moral center, needs to not be dependent on others for energy. What are some examples of, because like, we have, you know, our agricultural model seems completely opposite of what we're talking about here, like, um, and we're subsidizing crops that are not good for what they're being used for. What are some, give some numbers to potentially if we like if it was given to you a wand was given to you to like get us independent what are some of the things that you would do and crops you would grow and ways that you would go about doing that well i've actually done some thinking about this darren uh i recently since the ukraine war put together a 14 point plan for america to uh, follow to free itself of addiction to oil and make itself economically secure and to help the world be secure in a, a, a post climate change world that can't afford fossil fuels anymore. So, you know, that's the 14 point plans on my web suit that uh, alcohol can be a gas and legislators in Washington today are taking it seriously and are discussing it amongst themselves to possibly put forth legislation to adopt that plan. So the plan basically says we're not, we openly decide not to use oil anymore as our main fuel. And we start producing alcohol from, well, food processing waste. When they make all that orange juice, what does the orange peels and pulp go? Right. Goes to landfill, right? right? Oh, then they throw dirt over it and there's no air and it starts fermenting and it gives off methane. 
Right. That's 60 to 70 to 100 times more potent uh, climate change gas than carbon dioxide. Right. So what if we took all that pulp and all that waste and made alcohol with it instead? What if we opened up some of the literally billions of gallon, billions of acres of farmland to growing energy crops? Sweet sorghum, sugar beets, um, it goes on and on. In the Southwest, prickly pear cactus, mesquite. If we, you don't realize, unless you're into agriculture, just how much land we have. We have 5.4 billion acres of land that can grow one kind of crop or another. We're only using 70 million, right? 5.4 billion compared to this tiny number of 70 million acres to grow corn. And we use most of that to make alcohol first for fuel. And then the byproduct, all the solids left over, we feed to cows. And that's with this tiny quantity of land out of the total land of the United States. And it's similar for soybeans. So the point is, we as America have enough land to literally make enough fuel to fuel hundreds of little countries. And so they would never be insecure about energy again. And farmers in this country would be making um, you know, food and uh, not just uh, fuel, but the byproducts used for food and fertilizer and everything else. It is a mass hypnosis that has uh, got us growing on a tiny little speck of the total land we have when we could be absorbing solar energy from the sun with plants in the soil and power our whole economy. Why is anyone really talking about building new nuclear power plants when we got the biggest nuclear power plant there is? It's the dang sun. And just using that glow from 90 million miles away is enough to power the earth. You know, Bucky Fuller used to say, well, I, I believe in nuclear power. And I say this too. I do believe in nuclear power. But you got to put it in the right place in your design. And that right, right place is 92 million miles away from people. And it's called the sun. So we already have nuclear power. Let's just use it, employ plants to go ahead and make us all free of dependence for food or for energy on anyone. Right. And it's like, it's not one or the other, right? No. It can be fuel and food. And we have a surplus of land to do all of that. We could literally be energy independent and food independent. And, and have a stable, growing soil that gets better every year with a drawing a, down amazing rotation of crops, some energy, some food, yeah. so that the soil is constantly a constellation a mosaic of changing chemistries based on different plants growing and different bacteria and organisms growing with the plants and funguses, the soil would build up year after year with that kind of rotation. Yeah. So we have everything we need. And, you know, there is, and you'll often hear me say this, there is no requirement to do things stupidly. Right. We could choose to do things the right way. Right. We've certainly seen a lot of stupid choices. That's right. Yeah, and common sense seems to be punted a long time ago. Well, you know, it's common sense, the least common thing there is, right? Yeah. I mean, common sense is something you think everybody would know better, like he knew better and he did it <laughs> anyway, right? right? So, so you know, you look at using pesticides, it was always a bad idea. It was always a Band-Aid. It, it would take a whole show for me to talk about how bad and stupid that decision was. And yet we're still doing it. Right. Even though organic farmers make a lot more money and we keep taking more and more of the total market every year, all these guys are out there and you go, are they stupid? No, they're caught in a system that forces them to stay the way things are. If they don't, they can't get finance to farm. The banking system requires them to farm in the traditional way with pesticides and herbicides and if you don't the bank won't lend you money to grow your crop so it's an insidious insidious uh well worked out system with the oil companies in charge to sell their toxic chemicals pesticides and herbicides and and uh, fertilizers and enforce it through the economic system where farmers become addicted to using those chemicals not because they want to, but because they'd have to give up farming 
because the bank wouldn't lend them money if they don't do it that way. Yeah, so there, there's invisible handcuffs there. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it's, it's, it's. I, 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 I am so stunned all the time when I hear this stuff, and I don't understand the apathy that kind of gets permeated through all of this stuff. You know, you know, I've shared with you the fatal conveniences things that I do, and it's, and it's. It's helped me to start realizing the insidiousness that we have in so many different ways. But like, what, like, I think from your perspective, what is the hope here that you can share with people as they're hearing this stuff? What can they do? What can we do to help move this needle in more of a, regenerative circular way what do you think is the most powerful thing that we can do well the first thing we have to do is forget doing anything for sustainability sustainability i don't believe in it at all well what does sustainability mean it means let's make sure that gen seven generations from now they have the same level of resources we have today and I taught a permaculture course on the Blackfoot Indian Nation, and standing beside me was the medicine elder who invited me. And uh, he asked that question, what is sustainability? He said, I've heard a lot about it. What is it? And someone gave that answer. And then Wilbert said in some salty language, which I won't exactly quote here, he says, when are you going to fix all the stuff you screwed up? Because you're just saying you're not going to make it any worse. You're going to leave it the way it is now. So what is regenerative? Regenerative means with every act, with every season, with every plan, you are repairing the damage on what, under what you're under control of, what you're control of, and you're repairing the mistakes of the past. You're improving the soil. It's your job to not just stop damaging, but now you can actually go the next step and the more you improve the soil, the more food you get, yeah. the less bugs you have. In other words, you get rewarded for doing the right thing in all kinds of indirect ways. So I don't believe in sustainability. I believe in regeneration and that we have to keep repairing the planet we now have because, you know, it's a good planet and it's good planets are hard to find. Yeah. Yeah. As they say, there's no planet B. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of. Well, I, I'm 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 so grateful for you. I wish that number one, I could extract all your knowledge, <laughs> and uh, I try to take more and more as I go. But hopefully, we can illuminate more and more people. I'd love to get you on more and more to sure. discuss these things and to implement things and to to help change this this weird ass system that is dependent and not circular and complete and like i just go back to the seed like and i love your definition of regenerative because that's that's what nature is right it's a huge strong force in nature which cannot be rubbed out and will continue to resist all efforts of humans to negate it <laughs> and it will happen the only question is whether we'll be around to enjoy it. And that's, that's the reason why we as humans should do regeneration because as a species, we'd like to continue to be here for the next 4.5 billion years. And we may not be welcome soon in the own stew of toxic mess we make for ourselves. So there's no reason to go there. Let's just not go there. Yeah. Amen. All right, Darren. Thank you. Thank you.